Welcome to the Food Startups Podcast. Hey guys, and welcome to the Food Startups Podcast. I'm back in Medellin. Matt's back in Bogota. What's poppin', Matt? Oh, I never left, man. I have uh, had a good day, man. You know, some supplier visits as usual, but things are going good, and I'm pretty excited for this episode, man. Matt's one of the biggest hustlers in, in the biggest city in Colombia that I know, so it's always good to see what's up. Uh, it's a really good guest today, uh, and Matt is going to introduce Mr. Robert Thurston, a coffee connoisseur. Just so that we have you guys stick around and listen to the awesome interview, I'm going to reveal one importing tip that saved me hours of time and headaches with this new resource that I have for getting power of attorney done. So stick around for that. Yeah. And one thing we realized is there's a couple of tools we think, you know, we might dedicate an episode when we do this, but just tools that you can use in, in the food business online, making paperwork and phone calls easier. So we're going to try to start sharing more of these things. So that leads us to today's guest, Robert W. Thurston. He is an historian, turns coffee writer and entrepreneur, and he is the co-author and senior editor of Coffee, a comprehensive guide to the bean, the beverage, and the industry. Right now, he is a coffee roaster and retailer as well. Thanks a lot for joining us today. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to have you on, uh, for you to share some of your stories and some of your knowledge as to coffee. And uh, so I just want to start off and ask you, tell me about that cup that changed your mind about coffee and tell me a little bit about that story that's gotten you from that first cup that really got you into coffee and and today okay well uh first thanks a lot for having me on your your program really appreciate it everybody in the specialty coffee industry has a story about the cup of coffee the cup that really alerted them to the idea that coffee can be a fabulous beverage and I remember clearly a long time ago when I was a graduate student and didn't have much money at all, uh, seeing in a grocery store one day a, a special for Melita coffee already ground in a can, uh, a dripper cone, filters, and a carafe, and thinking, well, okay, I'll buy that, I'll try that. And, and it just tasted so much better than anything I'd ever had before. My mother used to make Maxwell House out of a can, and uh, it tasted like hot steel. It was horrible. But when when she opened the, the can of Maxwell House, there was this one puff of aroma that was so nice. And I thought, even as a kid, where did that go? That's not in the cup. But after that, that cup I had in graduate school, I thought, well, this is this is just really worth investigating a little bit more. And then when I got married a long time ago, uh, someone gave me a burr grinder for a wedding present. I'd never heard of such a thing before. So then I went out looking for beans to put in the burr grinder. You know, a burr grinder, the coffee drops through two grinding wheels. It's not a chopper where the blade spins around. So a burr grinder is what you want all the time. And since I had the grinder, I sought out beans and, and uh, filters and, whoa, all of a sudden it was, it was a completely different and much, much better drink. Awesome, awesome. And uh, just for our audience, what does the burr, just following up with the burr grinder, how, how does that impact the taste of coffee? Okay, well, the first, the difficulties with what most people have that they call ch uh, grinders, which are not, they're choppers. The blade whirls around and cuts up the beans. There are a couple of difficulties with that. One is that uh, often the the beans will be cut into different sizes, and so when you have uh, water flowing through, trying to flow through grains that are of different sizes, it's just going to produce a really uneven cup. And the second potential problem is that when you when you grind the coffee finely enough for let's say a paper filter, let alone espresso, you really run the risk of heating it a lot, and you just don't want to do that. The coffee's already been roasted, so why why heat it again? That can wreck it. Uh, burr grinder is much safer. It doesn't heat up the the beans as they fall between the two ridged metal plates that are literally ground. And then if you get a good burr grinder, the, the, the grains, uh, the ground coffee, the, the grains are going to be much more even and therefore will make a smoother cup of coffee and a much more predictable cup every time. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much. 
Yeah. So, and for listeners, I think it's spelled B U R R, correct, Robert? Right, right. Great. And we'll also link up to a burr grinder that Robert recommends um, if you're interested in purchasing one. I think I definitely am as well. Okay. Now, Robert, you know, in your book, one thing to me that was really interesting, and I'm going to read the quotes here, was comparing wine to coffee and how to bring coffee to have, or at least specialty coffee, bring specialty coffee to have the same value as wine does and increase the price. The quotes that interested me were, quote, the wine market has seen the results of its emphasis on high quality. Even when the price of average quality wine has decreased, the fine wine market has remained strong. And another quote, a $10 bottle of wine, generally considered not very expensive, the cost is $4.73 for a 12-ounce serving versus $0.53 cents for a 12-ounce serving of coffee at the same price. At $4.73 for a 12-ounce serving of coffee, you would pay $85 per pound. As we know, you know, never really pay $85 per pound, except for Price Peterson, which you'd have to read in, in the book. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but Robert, tell us about that. How can coffee become like wine in, in the future? Well, it, it, it is following the trajectory of wine in, in this country. Uh, we still have a long way to go, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a process of education. I mean, you know, 30, 35 years ago, uh, who cared where the coffee came from? Uh, who cared how it was roasted? Uh, but then, again, Starbucks has to take a lot of credit for this. Americans just became more and more educated about the coffee itself, the different kinds of tastes that you can find in coffee, the finish, the balance. Does it have sparkle on your tongue? Does it have chocolatey flavors? Does it have citrus? Does it have berry flavors? Does it have caramel? All of these things that you can find in really good coffees. Uh, and so there, it, I think a lot of, of what has happened and what still needs to happen in a big way is just educating the public. And I don't mean being snobbish toward the public that that's something i really really dislike uh, when the baristas get all puffy about what's supposed to be in the coffee and start telling people what they should find in a cup but i mean just just answering questions i have people in my store all the time asking me well what is really the difference between this coffee and that coffee how can i taste it we do coffee tastings in the store we have classes from the local university in our store i think it's just again it's it's a question of keeping on this path and just uh making americans aware all the time that there is there's a great great range of coffee out there this has happened with wine it has happened with cheese it has even happened with vegetables to some extent uh, I think we're, we've seen a terrific rise in the general level of sophistication in America toward food, toward wine. And this is spilling over, pardon me for the uh, saying, uh, it, onto coffee. And, and it, it will continue. But I think it's just a matter of, of time now. We're going in the right direction for sure. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I definitely agree. And uh, I like hearing you say that, that uh, American consumers are getting wiser and more sophisticated oh, yeah, they're consuming yeah. it's so cool it opens up opportunities for new markets yeah and i i just had one follow-up for you uh, sure where uh, i don't know what the wine movement was like in terms of educating folks on wine but where was coffee's kind of more palatable tastes where is the bean that americans actually started to enjoy because it wasn't such an extreme bean, or I don't know if that even took place in the United States, but uh, you get the drift of my, my question. How, how did this kind of coffee movement start? To go, to go back to Starbucks, they started a lot, a lot of Americans on uh, the milk drinks, um, lattes and cappuccinos and so on. And, and that's, that's kind of a way of easing Americans into coffee. Many, many Americans are still convinced that coffee has to taste bitter. Really good coffee is not bitter. Uh, but if you, take, if you take espresso as the base and then you add a lot of milk to it, the milk, and especially if it's whole milk, it, it has some natural sweetness. So that sort of softens the, uh, the coffee in a way. And then a lot, a lot of people, of course, put sugar in that stuff. And I, I think it's a question of trying to to move Americans off of the 
milk-based drinks and, and also off of dark roasted coffee. Uh, the darker the roast, the more the roast tends to override any flavors that are inherent in the beans. So I don't I, – I, th- I think, again, it's a question of, of educating people and just trying to get them to, to taste – different kinds of coffees you know there's so many wonderful coffees that if you if you just adjust your mind a little bit i think if you've never tried coffee without milk and sugar before if you just think okay i'm gonna try this and uh not that i'm going to like it or anything but just just uh just give it a try and every time you go to a coffee shop uh, anybody out there ought to to take that first sip of, of regular coffee, even of espresso, with nothing else in it. Just find out, <laughs> maybe for the first time in your life, if you actually like coffee, just plain coffee. So I'm not sure there's any one kind of bean. Some some are you know, have more natural sweetness than others. Like it, it'd be nice to start with the good Kona, but <laughs> that's pretty expensive. So any good. Latin American coffee. I mean, people probably are better off starting with coffee that doesn't have a lot of of body. Like maybe not try a Sumatran uh, for starters. Although some people like that that kind of strong body a lot too. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Uh, and Matt, if I can uh, if I can say one more thing, I think that you uh, I'm involved in the cacao world, and uh, my girlfriend actually is a tea entrepreneur. And I think uh, I've seen the same things with tea that. Uh, and cacao, that there's so much complexity and so much variety. Yeah. Uh, and some, th- some tastes are a little bit less accessible, but generally what happens is that the introduction to consumers is through the lens of sugar and cream. And, oh, yeah. of the, you know, it's really, it's interesting. And, you know, the thing is, is you can kind of have this kind of gut-wrenching reaction like, no, oh my God, this yeah. is getting wasted. But at the same time, if it gets people drinking it, you can't really fault it if it gets them on their way. So definitely appreciate that yeah. comment. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that's exactly right. And I, I, I've thought about posting a rule in my uh, coffee shop that would say, you must take a sip first without adding anything to the coffee. But you do have to give people what they want, at least uh, at least to begin with. Yeah, I would definitely second that, though. <laughs> okay, okay. Great, yeah, and I also wonder if, you know, if someone, maybe the one time they did try just black coffee, it was a Folgers or just a, a blend. That well, made a- yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, so many people have grown up with really bad coffee, and, and some people that they they like Again, you mentioned Folgers or whatever from a can. Um, some people are really absolutely used to that kind of taste. And, and I get people all the time who, who say things like, I like really strong coffee, by which they usually mean dark roast because they're not talking about the co- – We in the industry, you think of what is the concentration of solids in the cup? Uh, what is the ratio of ground coffee to water? That's the strength of the coffee. But so many people just associate strong coffee with dark and even uh, burnt and bitter stuff. But we're working on that. We're, we are making progress. Great. And Robert, I'm going to go back to your book here, which I highly recommend you read. And I'm not just saying that because Robert's on the show. I really did enjoy this book. <laughs> okay. and I, I kind of feel like if you if you read Robert's book, you go to a coffee tasting you know, visit a coffee farm and then maybe, and this is not a necessary, try roasting your own coffee. All of a sudden, you inter- you've gotten like Coffee 101. I would say that's pretty good um, okay. for an introduction. Okay. Um, so in your book, there's a really interesting part, and I don't know which person wrote this, but here's the quote from the book. Quote, small island coffees. These are Hawaiian Kona, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and St. Helena made famous by Napoleon's imprisonment there. Thus, St. Helena's coffee can sell for over $50 a pound. All islands are nearly unobtainable, all story and myth. While Jamaica's Blue Mountains have great potential, and Hawaii does produce some very good quality, these coffees are not multiples better, let alone better at all, than the great Central Americans and the exquisite Kenyan, by any stretch of the imagination. How can Central America and Kenya improve their marketing to demand prices closer to these small islands? Okay, let me say first that that quotation was from George Howell, 
who's a really, uh, really crusty guy, but until you get to know him. And he's known in the United States as the father of light roasts because he, he was out in Berkeley, California in the late 60s, and he uh, began to get coffee from uh, the man who introduced really good coffee to the United States, Alfred Peet, P-E-E-T, and Peet's Coffee and so on, takes his name from him. That's a long story. But anyway, George Howell's a great, a great, great coffee roaster and, and a wonderful expert on coffee. I, I agree with what he has said there, except that uh, some coffee from Kona and now also from Kau, also on the big island uh, of Hawaii. Kau, the Kau district is just a little bit south of Kona. There's some coffees coming out of there that are rated as highly as any I've ever seen and that are absolutely delicious. I haven't seen personally very much really good coffee from Puerto Rico, but, but maybe it's out there. So how could how could the Central American coffees market be marketed better? I, I think, again, it's a question of, of the independents doing the hard work here. It's just not going to happen at Starbucks, which is fine for the rest of us. When, uh, when people uh, go into independent coffee shops and they see, okay, here, here are, let's say, five coffees on offer today, and one is uh, Kona and one is Jamaican Blue Mountain, and one is uh, Costa Rican Terrazzo, something like that. Uh, and they, they'll, they'll come back and they'll try the different coffees. And, and they, I think they, they would just be educated in that way. Two great coffees that are, you know, coffees rated on a 100-point scale. Uh, you can find two really great coffees that are rated, let's say, 95 or 96 points, which is really high. And that's su- superb coffee, but they can be quite different. They really can can taste quite different and and feel different in your mouth. So I think it's a question of what you like, but also be willing to experiment. And it's really again, it's up to the independent coffee shops to to really offer uh, wonderful coffees and and a good variety to their customers. And we got to have curious people to try this stuff too. But that is happening. Definitely. Well, Robert, and I want to go back to your book like, you know, one more time, and there is Arabica, or I don't even really know how you would pronounce it or if there's a rule for it, but I would say Arabica and, and Robusta, right, Robusta. Arabica is like pretty much all specialty coffee today, and Robusta is used in blends and cheaper uh, coffees a lot from like warmer climates in Brazil. And in the, the book, it says Robusta production is likely to rise as global warming makes more land suitable for the hardier variety and unfavorable for Arabica. In your book, it is mentioned that some people, quote, argue that Robusta could find a niche in the specialty coffee market. Do you think this is true, and will it happen? I, I think that's true. Uh, everybody, by the way, says Arabica. Just, I just mentioned that and, uh, as the, the good species, put the emphasis on Arabica. But anyway, uh, Robustas definitely have a future because – because of global warming, and there already uh, are areas that have been lost to Arabica production and uh, some substitution of Robusta for Arabica, and it's a very, very uh, alarming trend and and unfortunate. Uh, I've seen projections that um, fully 50% of the coffee-growing area in Colombia, for example, could be lost within 25 years. I don't think we'll be growing coffee in Colorado anytime soon, but but you do have to wonder. And uh, Robusta is just, it's a, as the name implies, it's just a tougher species of coffee. It will grow at lower elevations. It can withstand drought much better. It can withstand uh, frost, whereas one night of frost will kill an Arabica tree. So I think the Robustas have to uh, come on more strongly than, than they have in the past. But I, I think what you're going to see is a lot of a lot more blending and uh, also a lot of um, a work on hybridization of Robusta with Arabica. Uh, there are also terrible, terrible problems around the world from diseases and insects 
uh, particularly the coffee berry borer in Spanish called broca, and that's that has spread all over. It's now in all the Hawaiian islands, for example, where it just wasn't there at all five or ten years ago. And Robusta can can stand up to those insects a little bit better, partly because it has a higher caffeine content. It has, on average, roughly twice, but it's, it's, it's a very rough rule of thumb, twice as much caffeine in a bean as an Arabica bean does. So I think that the – and there's terrific interest in Robusta farming and how can Robustas be developed that are smoother – uh, that that don't sort of have that 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 real jolt uh, that a great deal of caffeine in the bean will give you. So I think that's happening, and I I've already talked to some some roasters who who say, oh, there's nothing really wrong with robusta. It's a question of how it's cultivated. It's a question of how it's processed, and then how it's roasted. So uh, I think we'll see more and more of that, but. But for the time being, I, I haven't yet seen or tasted a Robusta that is, is smooth and, and sweet enough for me. The Arabica beans still have it all over the Robustas, but this, this could change quite quickly now, uh, partly because, again, pressure from global warming. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, you know, I uh, saw a headline uh, a few weeks ago that said that Starbucks is getting into actually owning farms specifically yeah. because of this issue yeah so that can maybe show how dire the situation is and how poor the outlook is for the next 10 20 30 years but there are a couple of reasons why various uh, companies will buy uh, land, or in some cases they don't buy coffee producing land, but they will make an agreement with a, a, a big farm. I've seen this in Brazil, for example, and the 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 Japanese or the Koreans or Starbucks will say, "Well, we want you to grow." this kind of coffee in this plot of land and we want you to treat it this way and so on and so forth. The Japanese are really, really meticulous about this kind of thing um, at, the, at the high end of their market. And Starbucks also, Starbucks and then Costa Coffee in uh, Britain have developed a, a lot of relationships with Chinese farmers in southwestern China uh, to to help them grow both robusta and arabica and and to work on improving the quality of both it's it's partly a process too of of the the companies medium size and large looking for new areas that might grow coffee in southwestern china and yunnan it's been a tea producing area and of course china has a tea culture but uh the switch to coffee is on among farmers there so we will see some new areas of the world coming uh onto the coffee market and vietnam did of course in a in a huge way in the 1990s they never produced or they didn't produce much coffee at all uh up into the uh the eighties and then they exploded onto the world scene and they're now the world's second largest producer behind Brazil. Uh, so there may be some other areas who knows, you know, Thailand produces some coffee, Burma, uh, Philippines. Now there could be much more production in Cuba and, uh, Puerto Rico than there is today. It's partly a problem of labor. Who's going to pick the coffee. Uh, and at the same time, incidentally, there's, there's very serious work going on on in uh, genetic modification of coffee beans. So we're seeing the, the hybridization out in the fields, or let's call it natural hybridization, a lot of work on GMO coffee and new areas coming uh, online. Whether this is going to be enough to to beat climate change in effect and, and keep on producing uh, good Arabica, and at the same time improving Robusta and then making hybrids between the two species, whether we can stay ahead of the curve of climate change or not, that, that's still really an open question. Gotcha. I don't know. Some, some days I'm optimistic. Some days I'm very pessimistic. Yeah, so do you expect, the, really quick, uh, do you expect the prices to be rising in the global coffee market in the next 10 years? You know, the price of coffee goes up and the price of coffee goes down, and this is a cycle that has been going on since um, probably the 1830s. 
uh, in the summer of 2011, coffee went above. It's a complicated story, but let's say the price for pretty good coffee sold on the International Coffee Exchange in New York went above $3 a pound. And then uh, as of about four or five months ago, it was down to $1.40 in that range. And then there was uh, a, a lot of information about a bad drought in Brazil Bang! The price of coffee goes up again, a dollar seventy, dollar eighty a pound. So it just depends on so many factors. I I expect that the price of really good arabica, rated let's say ninety points or more by the professional cuppers, that those prices will rise, and that'll be partly because of of high demand. The demand will increase just as it has for high quality wine. But at the same time, in the last few years, there's been a pretty good glut of coffee on the global market. And so after that peak in the summer of 2011, prices went way down again. I think it's going to be a while before we see, again, what's what's called the coffee C price based on the New York market. If we see that go above uh, uh, $2.50 soon, I'll be surprised. But ultimately... Sure, coffee. Coffee will rise. Ten years from now, I don't know, <laughs> but I th- I would say higher, definitely. And guys, I just want to put in a uh, disclaimer: this should not be used as uh, investment advice on the no. futures exchange uh, for coffee. <laughs> no, no, no. That is that is a risky business. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely. No, Robert. So listen, I just want. To, well, first, uh, uh, thanks a lot for for those uh, those answers and. Uh, thinking about those questions so thoughtfully, I wanted to sh- switch gears a little bit and start looking at the coffee from a businessman's perspective. Mm-hmm. So talk to me about what you do and uh, how you're involved in the business of coffee. Okay. Well, we are roaster retailer, and we uh, operate in a fairly small college town, Oxford, Ohio, near Cincinnati. So our immediate market in in terms of retail that is selling cups of coffee uh, and also bags of roasted coffee. Um, Those are both community people and and college students. And and so we, uh, in in the the coffee bar or coffee shop area is really pretty standard, although I like to think that we do a really good job of any kind of espresso drink and smoothies and juice and pour over. We make all of the coffee by hand. We don't have any machines, including coffee that we make ready to serve. We make it into air pots by hand with paper filters, and we'll make you a pour over coffee of, of anything else. It takes a few moments, but um, it's a fresher cup of coffee. We have a nice, we have to have an espresso machine. You can can't make espresso just by hand, but uh, it's not a it's not one with all the super bells and whistles. It's not what's called a super automatic machine. The baristas have to know what they're doing. And then the the roasting side, we buy green coffee. Uh, so far, we uh, we buy it all from one or two importers. Uh, and we roast it on the spot. We have a small roaster in the store, so that everything is small batch artisan coffee. Um, and there are only a couple of us who who roast, uh, so we take we take great care with the roasting process too. We do a lot of experimenting to figure out what the best roast is. Not only the for each kind of coffee, uh, you have to figure out what what uh, darkness of the coffee you want to achieve, and then how to get there. It's kind of a complicated process, but how how fast do you turn the temperature up? How long do you roast the coffee? How do you vary the airflow through the machine? These are all variables that really do affect the ultimate taste of the coffee. So uh, we're we're experimenting all the time, and, and we're learning all the time, too. I, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, we've only been in business in, in, in this whole business for about a year and a quarter and we have uh, accounts with restaurants with several stores that sell our bagged coffee we finally got a license to sell coffee with the logo and the brand of the university here it's miami university but it's not in florida it's in ohio the other one in florida stole our name really no kidding but um so that's that's what we do and we have a pretty good uh 
pretty good business already, and it's it's developing all the time. And we have a lot of regulars. We have a very comfortable, light and airy place for them to sit. Um, and we're not snobs. We just we're ha- we're happy to talk about coffee. Cool. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. And I, I, I'm pretty. I'm surprised to hear that you're in a college town. I know that a lot of people love their colleges, uh, love their coffee, especially uh, students that are up and studying. But I think that this is just an observation. You guys can feel feel free to uh, disagree. But probably five, maybe even uh, ten years ago, you wouldn't find a quality roaster in the, the biggest metropolitan areas in the United States. So it's amazing how much that the, the roasting industry has kind of changed. Oh, yeah, ab- absolutely. And I, I think people are starting to feel that, okay, we like local products, local food products as much as possible. Locavores who, in theory, don't eat anything that's raised more than 150 miles from their homes. People like local cheese, local milk. We have a really thriving farmer's market in our town, too. And so to to know who roasts your coffee and to realize that at least – the the process of preparing the beans is done locally a lot of people really like that idea and of course they can come in and and uh, get coffee that was roasted the day before coffee ought to sit by the way for 24 hours some some varieties ought to sit for like papua new guinea ought to sit for even three days after roasting before you make a cup of it but uh but they can be sure that it's been freshly roasted and and carefully treated by us and, and you know you go to the local grocery store you really you can't be sure of a lot of that stuff yeah so i was just wondering uh now you've uh, traveled ex- you've traveled pretty extensively to uh visit coffee farms and mm-hmm. go through investigations of coffee what do you do when you go on a coffee visit well, I'm looking for, first of all, uh, a very clean farm. You just can't mistreat coffee in the, in the processing uh, and, and expect it to come out well in the cup. I mean, I don't want to sound like it has to be a surgical operating room or something, but it, it's got to be it's got to be really shiny and <laughs> no leftover beans from last year and this kind of stuff. Oh, so yeah, that's- definitely. That's one thing I look for right away. Yeah, I've driven through uh, my fair share of Vietnamese uh, highway roads and seen a lot of coffee being dried on the side of the road and uh, having a lot of exhaust get uh, get absorbed onto where it's being dried. So I know what it means when you, you know there's a difference between clean coffee and coffee like that. Let's just yeah. say. You know, following up here, kind of a summary of everything we've discussed today. Where do you think the coffee consumer market is headed? And how do you factor in? Do you have a five-year plan? <laughs> yeah, that seems to go back to my uh, my work on Soviet history, but I'll let that go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I think, again, we are headed in the right direction. And one indication is that – oh, I'll just give you one example. I went to give a talk last April at the London Coffee Festival, and uh, that's been going on for – Oh, maybe eight years now. And there was just a huge crowd of people uh, who stood in line. Some of them stood in line for hours just to get into the coffee festival. They need a larger venue for sure. Uh, And I'll be going to the Specialty Coffee Association of America in Seattle very soon. And so these coffee shows are now all over uh, the country, all over this country, all over uh, Europe, and there are there are wonderful, wonderful coffee operations in in uh, Germany. I mean, it's it's, it's hard to find a, even a small town in Germany that doesn't have really good coffee now. So uh, I think that this is and South Korea. I haven't been there, but I understand it's just exploded uh, in regard to coffee. So. I think in this country, we are, uh, as I've said before, really going in the right direction. And and people, they they want to know what's happening locally. They want to know uh, what what uh, the quality of what they're uh, getting is. And uh, just as they want good cheese and good wine, they they, they really do want uh, good coffee more and more often. As f- as far as where. I might be and our business might be uh, what I uh, hope to be able to do very soon is to uh, develop a separate roasting facility, which would uh, not we will keep the retail 
uh, coffee bar that we have, but get a much larger capacity roaster, maybe 10 kilos at a time, you know, 22, 25 pounds in that range at a, at a time, and, uh, or possibly larger than that, as we develop more accounts, but never lose sight of the, of the uh, idea that we are meticulous about every roast and, and just see how that, that spreads. And I think there's, there's plenty of room around here for that. And we seem to convert people almost every day in our store and people who come in and say, wow, you know, I never, I never had coffee like this. I never had coffee this good before. And it's naturally sweet. Wow. I say, yeah, it really is. So I think we're, we're, we're doing well and, and maybe not just in five years, but in within two years, I hope to, to have a large roaster installed and be, be uh, dealing with a lot larger volume of coffee. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thanks a lot for sharing. It definitely, uh, sure. Sure. Uh, definitely, see, definitely hear your passion uh, and your commitment <laughs> to quality, which is okay. Which is awesome because I think that's what coffee is kind of all about. Okay. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Happy to be here. Great. And and Robert, one uh, last thing, and this is a, we're definitely going to link this up on the podcast. I found in one of the articles of your book there is a link to a historical fiction novel called The Coffee Trader. Yes. And yes. have you read it? Yes. And would yes. you recommend it to others to read? I mean, just it's really exciting. You can learn a little bit about coffee, and it's really cool for commodities trading. How did you feel yeah, about the book? I, I, I like it. I, I liked it a lot. Uh, it, it gets pretty complicated, incidentally, when you're trying to figure out what they are doing as they're trading coffee on the Amsterdam Commodities Exchange uh, in the 1640s, it gets very complicated. But uh, but I think, uh, and I, I, if I put in a little plug for my book, if you read the section of my book on how coffee prices work, and that, that is a part that I wrote myself, and then you read the novel, The Coffee Trader, I think you could understand a little bit better what's going on as this one guy tries to corner the whole coffee market in all of Western Europe. And yeah, I like it. I, I don't know the don't know the author at all, but I think he did a very good job with the atmosphere of Amsterdam and of trading in commodities and uh, the introduction of various people to coffee and how excited all that is for them sure good book fantastic well well again just to sum up um robert w thurston and his book is called a comprehensive guide to the bean the beverage in the industry also as a coffee roast and retailer oxford coffee and you can find all of this on our blog post episode at the food startups podcast.com great and i just wanted to add in one more thing just aside from the interview I had a great experience this week with a service uh, called HelloSign.com, which helps me digitally sign documents. And this is for power of attorney and for importing things. Hugely important. I downloaded, uh, actually just set up a membership, and uh, I was able to, in about five minutes, get some documents signed that Adobe Acrobat couldn't do uh, at all. So uh, that's just a tip for you guys, and that was really helpful for importing paperwork. So. Thanks a lot again, Robert, and thanks, listeners. Uh, please leave your comments. Looking here, looking here from you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, find us online at foodstartupspodcast.com.